Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe says he expects Ottawa to still give his residents some rebates, even though he stopped collecting and paying the tax on home heating. I would expect it to mirror whatever is happening and the federal government is doing in Atlantic Canada where they made an identical decision on home heating fuel. So if, it, if it's a proportional reduction in Atlantic Canada, we would expect it to be a proportional reduction here. So uh, pay less tax, uh, you get a smaller rebate, that's, that's fine. Uh, our goal would be to pay zero uh, of the carbon tax. For the federal response to that, I'm joined now by Minister of Energy and Natural Resources, Jonathan Wilkinson. Minister, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. You, you heard Scott Moe's view there that he thinks a proportional reduction in the rebates uh, based on what they're withholding from you it seems like a reasonable compromise. Is, is that something you're willing to accept, even though Saskatchewan is defying federal law? Well, it's certainly not a reasonable compromise when a provincial premier decides that they are going to willfully break the laws in this country. Um, it's pretty historic, and uh, I don't think anybody has ever seen the likes of it before. Certainly not a province like Saskatchewan that has given such great leadership to Canada through Tommy Douglas, Alan Blakeney, Ross Thatcher, and Roy Romano. So I find it pretty shocking. I think most Canadians would find it pretty shocking. But in terms of the rebate itself, um, we will, uh, obviously, the rebate is based on how much is actually paid. All of that money goes back if uh, the province is not going to rebate the money associated with home heating um, then there will be a reduction in the rebate accordingly uh, unfortunately that will hit people who actually live on modest incomes uh, all of the research shows and scott mo can make up whatever he wants to in terms of his opinion but the data is clear go talk to brent uh, brent doder at the university of regina or trevor tombs at the university of calgary it's people who live on modest incomes that get the most money back much more than they pay and so he is going after and attacking the most vulnerable people who live in Saskatchewan. So, but, but Minister, I, I mean, the rebate is one thing. The fact that he is blatantly defying and breaking the law is another. I, I mean, what is the government going to do about that? Well, as I say, I think it's shocking, and I think Canadians should be shocked. I mean, uh, that, that a, an elected premier of a province is saying that he can choose which laws he will actually abide by and which he will not. I mean, the, if, if his citizens take the same view with respect to provincial laws, you will have anarchy in the province of Saskatchewan. It's it's shocking. Um, and uh, and I think that people in Saskatchewan and across the country should be appalled at, at behavior, such irresponsible behavior on the part of a provincial premier. Um, we are going to look at, at what they have done, and obviously we're going to have conversations about what the consequences are going forward. Um, we have not come to any determination of that. I still hope that they will step back from the brink and actually behave like law-abiding citizens. But, you know, I guess at the end of the day, that's up to Premier Mo. The, the legislation says people can go to jail for up to a year. They can be fined a set amount based on the, what they were supposed to remit if they refuse to pay. I mean, will you look at criminal actions against the government? And how does that work when it's a federal government against a provincial government? Well, as I say, we're, we're going to sit down and, and uh, have the conversations about the different options and try to be thoughtful about that. I don't think anybody's talking about putting people in jail. Um, but at the end of the day, the expectation is that provincial premiers will abide by the law, just like every other citizen in this country. That is not a novel sort of concept. It's something that we just expect as a matter of course. And we live in a democratic society. At the end of the day, if Scott doesn't mow, doesn't like a particular law, he can either run for office provincially, if it's a provincial law, and change it, um, or he can actually uh, work with the opposition, which I know he does on an ongoing basis, and try to change the law by, by changing the federal government. That's what a democracy is. But you don't get to pick and choose which laws you actually decide you're going to abide by and which you don't. Right. So I get to vote in an election. So if I don't like what you're doing, I can vote. But if I break the law between now and election day, I expect to have consequences. So we heard from Minister Gilbo saying that, that there would be measures taken. Like, what are we talking about here? Because I, I can never recall in my time, I've seen a lot of federal provincial battles. I've never seen a premier and a government simply refuse to follow the law of the land. Well, I, I have never seen that either. And Believe me, I mean, I used to work for the government of Saskatchewan. I spent several years there working as a constitutional negotiator and a federal provincial relations expert. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I love that province. It, uh, it is where I grew up. I, I, it has always produced enormously thoughtful premiers up until this point. I, I just think it's shocking and, and appalling that a provincial premier would behave in this way. And, and it really is not becoming of somebody in that role. Okay, but, you know, the argument is that Scott Moe is doing this for political reasons. He's got an election this year, but so does Blaine Higgs, so does Andrew Fury, so does David Eby. I, I mean, clearly the federal government needs to do something to suggest that its laws need to be upheld other than denounce it. Um, 
because a, sure. a government can't get away with something a citizen can't get away with. For sure. Uh, at the end of the day, the government is going to have to do something. There's no question. You can't allow provinces to simply thumb their nose at laws that have been upheld in the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, again, if you get to pick and choose which laws you actually get to abide by and which ones you can decide not to, you have anarchy in this country. Like, that just doesn't work. So there will have to be consequences. All I'm saying is we need to be thoughtful about how we do this. We need to make sure that we've you know, looked at all of the different options and uh, before we make a decision. And that's certainly something that the government of Canada is going to do. Well, but we've known for months that they were contemplating this, Minister. So surely some sort of contingency planning must have been going on in terms of getting ready for this. So w when, when will we know uh, what the federal government is going to do about this? Like, what is the timeline before we know how you're officially going to respond to what Premier Mo is doing here? Well, I would say, first of all, I don't think any of us, certainly I, uh, didn't actually believe the province would willfully flout uh, the law. Like, I, I just didn't believe that a provincial premier would get it to get him, himself into that situation. It is, um, it is historic. It is historic in the history of this country where a provincial premier can simply say, we're, we're just going to choose not to abide by a law. Like, that's just... It's crazy. It's like a tin pot dictatorship. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I don't think any of us believed that, that he would actually go through with it because it just didn't make any sense. So we are in the process of looking at the different options and we will be bringing something uh, forward in the near term. But all I would say is we want to make sure it's thoughtful, that we actually are able to communicate it um, effectively and, and communicate with Canadians about what, you know, what the options were and why we actually chose one versus another. Um, I think Canadians across the country are probably pretty shocked about the behavior of the, of the Premier of Saskatchewan as well. Yeah, I mean, the, reducing the rebate is one thing, but for a government that doesn't support carbon pricing, doesn't support the rebates, uh, and for a province that seemingly doesn't support it either, I'm not sure what kind of consequences there are in, in taking that step. Though I understand why you have to do it, because it's meant to be a revenue-neutral measure. Uh, do you look at other transfers to the province? I mean, they get infrastructure money, they get health money, they get all kinds of, of, of federal cash. If they're not going to follow federal law, do you start looking at those other revenue streams? As I say, um, there are a number of different options that we can consider. We're going to have to be sitting down and having all of those conversations before we actually start to opine publicly. But I would say, look, I, I mean, this comes from a provincial premier who has no climate plan, who says that he believes in net zero by 2030, but has no interim targets, has no real um, uh, initiatives to actually focus on this. He has decided that the price on pollution is something that he doesn't like, even though uh, it actually is demonstrably effective in reducing carbon emissions and it's an affordability measure and it actually helps people in Saskatchewan who live on the most modest incomes to actually pay their grocery bills um, so you know uh, I I throw up my hands a little bit with with this guy like uh, he, he he operates without any data without any facts um, and uh, and he goes after the most vulnerable people that live in, in in Saskatoon and Regina and the rest of the province like it's just it's just silly the fact that he is seizing upon, though, is that this government uh, exempted one particular type of heating oil, that being home heating oil, from paying the carbon tax, primarily because of the economic and, and political concerns uh, in Atlantic Canada. And that his argument, and Daniel Smith has made a similar argument, that they're living with the Supreme Court decision on, on the carbon pricing that they don't agree with because it was their expectation that it would be applied equally. And by doing carve-outs, you're no longer applying it equally and fairly as a government. So, so what is your response to that political argument from Premier Mo? Well, I've heard him say that. Obviously, I don't agree with it. I mean, it is very different. Home heating oil is three to four times more expensive. It has escalated far more quickly than any other home heating fuel. And uh, if you actually implement a heat pump, uh, you can actually save enormous amounts of money with respect to heating oil. It's also the dirtiest from a GHG perspective. It's not the same as natural gas, where the, the savings associated with implementing heat pump are actually pretty neutral. Um, so this is a program that we actually focused on the people. Uh, and again, people who have uh, heating oil are generally the most energy poor. So we focused on ensuring that we were addressing that key affordability issue for people who are paying far too much for energy, putting in place a program to give people on modest incomes free heat pumps so they can save money going forward. Um, and uh, and that is uh, applied across the country. And, you know, people focus on Atlantic Canada, but there are more heat pumps or more uh, heating oil homes in Quebec than there are in Atlantic Canada. And they're the same amount in Ontario as there are in all of Atlantic Canada. So this was a Canada wide program. It wasn't just about Atlantic Canada, no matter what Scott Moe wants to say. Well, no, look, I, I, I understand that as an Atlantic Canadian, but it was the Prime Minister and the Atlantic Caucus who announced it with Cody Blois, the chair of the Atlantic Caucus, hosting the news conference and 
the language of the day said it made it very clear it was about Atlantic Canada. So I wonder, just as a final point, Minister, it, 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 are you concerned that this is more than just a made in Saskatchewan challenge for you today, that other provinces may follow suit on this? Well, look, I, I, first of all, I mean, the, the Atlantic Canadian part of the announcement was because the people with the greatest degree of energy poverty live in Atlantic Canada, not in the rest of the country. So let's just be clear about that. Um, but in terms of spreading to the rest of the country, I mean, I have faith in, in provincial premiers across the country that they actually believe in abiding by the law, too. They expect that the federal government will respect provincial laws. We expect that they will respect federal laws. And we expect Canadians will actually abide by the laws of the land, both federal and provincial. I don't think that other premiers, I could be wrong, but I really doubt that other premiers are really of the view that they should be able to selectively break the law. Federal Energy Minister Jonathan Wilkinson, thank you for your time today, sir. Thank you. Okay, so how unprecedented is this situation? Sujit Chaudhry is a lawyer and constitutional expert. He's also the managing partner with Hockey Chambers Law. Uh, it's good to speak with you, sir. Thanks for joining me. Nice to meet you, too, and good to speak with you about this. Okay, so you heard there. The Federal Environment Minister, Stephen Gobo, says that Saskatchewan is breaking the law and that measures will be taken. What measures can the federal government take when a province just refuses to, to, to follow the rules here? Right. So there is, you know, the, the greenhouse gas, uh, you know, a Pollution Pricing Act was upheld by the Supreme Court in 2021, and it has a number of kind of enforcement mechanisms, and those include uh, criminal penalties, uh, including the payment of fines and also um, the um, a prison time. So mm -hmm. there is kind of criminal exposure for individuals who don't pay the charges, including directors and officers as well. So uh, that was when they contemplated this being a utility or an energy company, but not necessarily a subnational government, is, is my guess, because Saskatchewan had to move the responsibility away from its utility, Sask Energy, to protect the directors and move it to the government to put the liability there, which the Canada Revenue Agency agreed to. So does this mean we're potentially headed for His Majesty the King versus His Majesty the King? Like, how does this work? Yeah. Yeah, so it's. I think it's a little bit. So I, I think it's important to kind of step back a bit and think about what Saskatchewan might be doing. Uh, so the in in November, the Saskatchewan legislature passed a statute that um, changed uh, the the um, the remitter of the federal carbon levy from Sask Power, which mm -hmm. is a crown corporation, to the province. Uh, and then the province uh, filed an application with CRA to be designated as a remitter of the carbon levy. And as you know, that came through in the last couple of weeks. And so the question is, what difference does it make uh, uh, to the province being the remitter as opposed to the to SAS power? And the answer is um, there's a provision of the Constitution called Section 125, uh, which basically says that provincial property can't be taxed by the federal government. Hmm. And so th they might be thinking that because this is now uh, provincial, uh, the carbon tax, as it's colloquially called, um, doesn't apply to them. The, the problem with that argument uh, is that in uh, 2021, um, Ontario uh, tried to argue that the carbon levy was a tax, and the Supreme Court, uh, uh, which was otherwise divided on the greenhouse um, gas tax, or pardon me, levy, um, unanimously held that it wasn't a tax, it was a right. regulatory charge. And so, so Saskatchewan's still bound by that regulatory charge, and as far as I can tell, they're still legally obliged to pay it. Okay, so it, it's a regulatory charge under law, it's a tax in the vernacular and, and, in, the, exactly. and in the political debates. But so... Where does this go then? If the federal government takes action, does this go to criminal court? Does this go to federal court? Does this go to the Supreme Court? Like, where does something like this get litigated outside of a ballot box? Because this is a legal question is uh, more than a political question at this point in time. Right. So I got to say, I, I'm quite taken aback by all this, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm quite frankly puzzled by it. And I, I saw a, a clip of the provincial minister saying he had retained... Um, personal legal counsel, and I suspect mm -hmm. that's because they don't think they're in the free and clear. And um, I think they're hoping to engage in a political negotiation over the carbon tax. So I was going to say a couple of things about this. The first is that this type of an issue 
um, could spread, right? So, the, yeah. you know, Saskatchewan is not the only province in which the the carbon levy is federally imposed. Uh, there's Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario. Um, there's also New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland, uh, and as well, um, Yukon and, and Nunavut. Okay, so everyone except for BC, um, North Northwest Territories and Quebec. And so if if Saskatchewan can make this move, then you can imagine there are discussions happening um, elsewhere about whether this move could be made. And um, it would be very regrettable and quite serious if this generated criminal prosecutions and um, it would be wise for everyone to step back a bit. Mm-hmm. I, I will say that um, I, I've always maintained that as the price of carbon went up, this would be probably the most difficult thing we've ever had to deal with as a country. Hmm. And I, I think we're seeing that now. But um, it's going to be very challenging politically to manage this. And we're beginning to see friction around this already. Well, uh, there's no question about that. And it is an election year in Saskatchewan. So, so that is potentially playing a role in all of the calculations here. But uh, look, our, our audience may uh, recognize you from, from working at the Emergencies Act inquiry, the Rouleau inquiry, and, and your arguments there. And, and whatever you thought of what the federal government did there, and the federal court has, has weighed in on that, um, they believed, they were arguing in good faith, in accordance with the law, at least this is what they say, based on the legal opinion and advice they had available to them, which they did not make public for solicitor client privilege. Scott Moe knows he's breaking the law. You know what I mean? When, when he was sworn in as premier, he put his hand on some kind of book and took an oath to uphold the law. So, like, how do you deal with this when a first minister at the provincial level just is absolutely refusing to, to live up to that oath and live up to the law of the land? Look, so I, I can't, you know, speak to what um, Mr. Moe has or has not been advised legally. Mm-hmm. I know they have an excellent Department of Justice in Saskatchewan. I've worked with them, and they're terrific lawyers. So I, I don't want to kind of cast disparagement on his assessment of the situation. I, I do think it's it's hard for me to see a pathway to legal success here that for Saskatchewan that isn't fraught with all sorts of risk. Uh, including for um, political leadership. And so I I think it would be wise to step back and reflect because this is a dangerous road to go down and it it could um, spread uh, to other jurisdictions. And so I I hope people take a step back and reflect uh, because it's quite a serious move to make. Have you ever seen anything like this? I I have seen political battles over my quarter of a century in journalism. I have never seen a premier just flat out say, we are not going to comply with the law. No, I I can't say. Look, I've been doing constitutional law for 30 years, um, and I can't think of a precedent like this, to be honest. You know, we're a country governed by the rule of law. And we settle our disagreements over what the law uh, requires uh, through uh, litigation and in the courts. And then we accept the judgments of courts when they're handed down. So it, it might be that there is a legal plan B here. It might be that Saskatchewan wants to go back to court and argue that the carbon levy imposed by federal statute is, in fact, a tax mm. not a regulatory charge. Maybe it has arguments it wants to make based on the home heating oil exemption, but they haven't shared that with the public yet. And so I I do think it's incumbent upon political leaders always uh, when they exercise executive power uh, to make manifestly clear to the public the legal basis for their authority. And and so I understand that that the leadership in Saskatchewan has taken the view that they're acting within the law. I do think they need to reassure the public that they have a legal case. Yes. Uh, right now, it has largely been a political argument that it's not fair, so we're not complying. And, and that's what it's come down to. So l- like you, sir, uh, we await the legal arguments. I, I want to thank you for, for walking through the uncertainty on all of this with us. Suji Chowdhury, Managing Partner with Hockey Chambers Global. Thank you, sir. Good to speak with you. Thank you.